The day is in the midst of a year-long look at affordable housing in the region. What specifically do you think the legislature should do to help people who can't afford to buy a home or are struggling to rent an apartment? Well, affordable housing is clearly a big issue in, throughout the state. Um, there is a significant need and lack of affordable housing. And I think it's um, important because many people have a different concept of what affordable housing is. Some people's idea of affordable housing is what we used to refer to as Section 8 housing. Um, and they have this notion that if that comes into their community, it's going to decrease their property values. I think, first of all, the state could do a much better job at advertising some of the great programs that we do have to get into a house, an affordable home. We have programs through um, Chifa where you can be a first-time home buyer, and many people don't recognize that a first-time home buyer in the state of Connecticut means that you haven't owned a home in three years. So you could have had a home before and then decided to sell it, you know, if you're retired, et cetera, and then you want to get back in and, be, and have a home ownership, you would be considered a first-time home buyer. And they have programs based on income where the state of Connecticut, as, um, with this partnership we have with Chifa, will help make the down payment on your home. Um, income-based, anywhere from 30000 to 50000 at some point. And that is not a program that many people know about that can help you get into your first home. The other thing is um, affordable housing. I, I like to call it mixed income housing because people have this connotation of what, again, affordable housing is. And affordable housing really means that not more than 30% of your income is spent on your home or your rental unit. And there are rental properties throughout southeastern Connecticut that are considered affordable housing, but most of us would say, wow, that rent is not even affordable. So I think we um, need to do a better job at marketing what we do have and explaining to the public or educating the public on what affordable or mixed income housing actually is, how it can benefit the community, um, and also the process of planning and zoning within the town. Many um, towns that I have uh, the privilege of representing Sometimes when an affordable development comes in, people don't want it there because they don't understand how it works and they have a misconception of what it actually means. They believe that there's going to be increased crime or uh, drug use, and that's actually just not the case in affordable housing. Um, it's really mixed income housing. It's where your teachers or your police officers or your new engineers at Electric Boat can afford to live. So I think starting with doing a better job at marketing the programs we do have, which are vast and many people don't know about them, to also doing a better job of explaining to the community or educating them on what affordable or mixed income housing is, how it can be a benefit, how, can, how it can be an economic driver. And then bottom line though, in the end of it, I think that um, the state this past year was looking at penalizing towns that don't have a certain percentage of affordable housing. And that may sound great on paper. I know that's something that probably the day supports. But if you look at it, the smaller towns that I represent, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to support affordable housing. They don't have access to sewer and water. They don't have access to transportation. There's not necessarily downtowns. So are you going to penalize rural towns that can't meet that goal? And instead of a you know, penalizing towns, I think that we should incentivize towns. Incentivize towns to try to work with their community to find out how they can incorporate affordable housing into the mix that makes everybody happy and where it should go, what it should look like, and how they can give back to the community, but an incentive rather than being penal penalizing against towns. I also think that the legislature has done some things in this past session that many people don't know about. We made it so that you can have an accessory dwelling on your house. I actually did that myself for my parents. And um, local towns must adhere to that. So you're allowed to have an accessory dwelling on your property to maybe care for elderly uh, parents or a loved one, et cetera. So we are making steps, but we definitely need to do more. All right, thank you. Okay, next question. Connecticut recently enacted a law designed to provide safeguards against lawsuits for out-of-state patients seeking abortions in Connecticut and any provider who helps them. Do you support efforts to make Connecticut such a safe haven? Well, I think you're talking about um, HB 
5414. Um, that was a bill that did two things, and there's a lot of misconceptions about that bill. The first thing it did is it allowed clinicians to work up into their top of the scope of practice, and the scope of practice is, um, it basically is their job description of what they can do within their confines of being an APRN or a PA or a physician. And performing a surgical abortion is within the scope of practice for both PAs and APRNs. So this bill, the first thing it did was basically update our regulations to name APRN and PA as being able to perform a surgical procedure that was within their scope of practice. People don't understand how scope of practice works. It's very confusing. But typically, we do this all the time in public health. We will allow a respiratory therapist to do something because it's within their scope of practice. This one was unique because years ago, when our abortion laws in Connecticut were codified in state statute in a bipartisan fashion, it named just physician. Medicine has changed over the last 32 years, and now uh, PAs and APRNs that do much more difficult procedures than this actual procedure are, it is within their scope of practice to do, but because it was in statute as just listing an MD, you couldn't do it. So you had to go through this process to add both um, PA and APRN to the regs. So that was the first part of the bill. The second part of the bill provided protections for our clinicians that are performing procedures in Connecticut from being sued from a third party in another state. Now many of my colleagues will say, well that's not constitutional, you can't have one state suing into another state for something that is done legally in that state. That sounds great, but Texas passed a law which it was a little um, shady the way that they had written the language. So there was the possibility that it could be opened up if a woman traveled to Connecticut to have a procedure, a legal procedure done here in the state of Connecticut by a physician doing this legally. That physician could be liable for a lawsuit by not even um, that person's family member, but on behalf of a third party could sue that clinician. We wanted to make sure that we protected our clinicians in the state of Connecticut for performing something that is legal here in the state. We don't have enough clinicians here in the state of Connecticut. We're trying to attract them to come here to the state of Connecticut so they can care for our population. So we want to make sure those that are here are protected. And if this went forward, it would set a terrible precedent uh, for other procedures uh, that may come down in the future. What if another state decided that a certain procedure was illegal? Maybe it's a life-saving procedure. And yet, if somebody came here for that procedure, um, our clinicians could be sued. So that's why I supported the bill. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. The state's surplus has grown to over $4 billion. Do you support the decision to use some of that to lower the state's pension debt? Or do you think more should be returned to the taxpayer? Well, that's an, that's an interesting question. So if you take the surplus and you return it to the taxpayer, I can understand how you see you have the surplus. It's, it can be um, considered overtaxation at some level. You're sitting there with everyone's money. Um, but if you're paying down debt, then you're not going to have to go back to the taxpayer to help fund the debt payment. I'm somebody who would like to pay down the debt. We have exorbitant debt in the state of Connecticut. But I don't want to spend the whole surplus on that because although we have a surplus now, we are looking at major deficits in the next two years in the state of Connecticut. So right now, the state of Connecticut looks flush with cash. But the majority of that is because we've received so much federal funding over COVID. That federal funding, we're just printing money in Washington, has led to inflation and everything else we're seeing. But we have this, you know, cachet of cash sitting there. You can see the governor during his campaign has been passing it out here and there. Uh, but I don't think that we should be um, look, looking at that frivolously. I think we should either be paying down some of the debt. Um, I know that my caucus has offered tax incentives and tax relief. I would like to see some of that money, more of that money used to help people be able to pay their heating bill this winter. Um, we have a LIHEAP program that is a federal program which helps low income individuals be able to pay for fuel. It's a fuel assistance program, but it's not enough. And you know, the even people that are middle income making $100,000 a year are going to struggle to fill up their oil tanks this year. I don't want to see anybody go cold or freeze over this, you know, the next few uh, months that we're going to see cold weather come in. And our caucus would like to give some additional relief. There could be money used for that. I also wanted to see some of that money as a direct subsidy for our farmers. I have represent a lot of farms, especially from North Stonington uh, North. 
and they are really struggling. Their input costs are up 169% this year alone because all their products are petroleum based from fertilizer to the pots in the plants to even those little burlap um, you know, pots that you plant into the ground. They are struggling with the price of diesel oil and a direct subsidy to keep our farmers um, whole or even surviving is something that I think is well worth the money. Okay, thank you. Number four, question number four, um, is how should Connecticut move forward to address climate change with regards to electric vehicles, wind power, and other clean energy strategies? Well, I think we have moved forward as far as climate change. There has been two bills that passed this year, SB 10 and SB 4, that both deal with pretty much the electrification of Connecticut. Um, you know, there's big incentives for electrical vehicles if you purchase one. Um, there's credits. They've actually extended that to electric bicycles. Um, I think we are addressing it here in the state of Connecticut. Um, I think we have to be cautious on the push. There is so much push in the electrification, um, but we're not looking at what that's doing to energy energy prices. Um, the cost of energy, if everything electrifies, our grid can't even support it right now. So I think we have to diversify our energy use. There's things that we could do right now to help decrease energy costs. They, well, I call them policy taxes that are on your electricity bill that are about 10 percent of what you pay when you pay your electric bill, which there's not one person that I hear from the district that is happy about their Eversource bill. And the idea of energy um, you know, offshore sounds fantastic. It's subsidized right now, but it's not just the cost of, of producing the energy. It's the cost of transmitting it to where you need the energy. So the further you way, away you are from the source, the more expensive it is to get it there. And that's why everyone, when they look at their energy bill, they're saying, oh, I use $200 of energy, but it cost me 400 to get it here. Um, so I think we have to keep that in mind. I don't think that there's one source of energy that is the cure-all. I think we have to diversify. I'd like to see us reconsider the use of nuclear power. Um, I think that we can't put all of our you know, eggs in one basket, and, but we have done a lot for climate change. I think that there's more that could be done, especially, especially along the shoreline. Um, you know, I had proposed um, some funding to come to the town of Stonington, in particular to shear up the, the uh, seawall and to help prevent flooding in downtown Mystic. Those are the types of things that we're going to have to make investments in in the future. Look what just happened to Florida. Um, so I think we have done a lot, and there's still more to, more to come. But you know, if you look at those two bills alone, those are significant um, movements towards uh, renewable energy and looking at climate change. We've also allowed uh, municipalities, if they choose to, to set aside a special fund for climate change. So those are little but intentional steps that we can um, take to try to combat climate change and or to learn how to deal with it. Okay, thank you. All right, question number five. Do you think the 2020 election was conducted fairly and Joe Biden won? And as a follow-up to that, do you support early voting and voting by mail initiatives? The first um, answer is yes. The second answer, do I support early voting? We're, there's an initiative on the ballot to be able for Connecticut residents, I supported that, for them to decide if they want to have early voting here in the state of Connecticut. Um, if that comes back and the residents of Connecticut want to have early voting, then we will have early voting. I'm not against early voting. I'm not against no excuse absentee voting. I just want you as the person to request the ballot or the application. And I do support having to show an ID to get that application. We have to show IDs for every other, um, you know, you have to show ID to pick up your child at school. You have to show an ID this last, um, in the last few months that we've had free COVID tests by town. If you went to the town to get a COVID test, you had to show your ID. There's no reason for anyone to not be able to have access to an ID. And I think that if we just do that, it just levels the playing field. It doesn't take, it takes all or any question that people may have or stir up to completely out of the picture. So if we want to vote early, sure. If we want to vote by absentee ballot, I'm fine with that for no reason you know, no excuse absentee ballot. I think one of the big questions that comes up in the legislature is how early is early? Now our town clerks, when we were talking about this, many of our town clerks are against early voting because they don't know how they're gonna do it. How early is it? Is it a month? How do I have 
a special secured location to be able to vote to come into town hall to vote if it's a month early. So I think those are the things once we get the um, vote from, from our people in the state of Connecticut, if they want to have early voting, which I think will probably pass, then it becomes the legislature's job to decide how early is early. Um, you know, I, I can think of elections just recently um, in the state of Connecticut where even if it was three weeks before an election, something happened with a candidate and they decided to get out of the race, that person's still on the ballot. So if you voted early, you might have voted for someone who's no longer in the race. Do you want to, you know, how do you pull back that ballot? So there's, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds. We just have to figure out what the, what the right accommodations are. So people have access, they can come in and vote when it's convenient. And um, we have a method to make sure that those that are voting are really the people that are voting. Okay, thank you. All right, um, and the last question, this is a little more specific to the 18th district. So the question is, how do you think the growth at electric boat will impact the region? And how as a legislator, uh, will you help the region prepare for that growth and an influx of employees in a way that benefits both the employees and the residents who currently live here? Well, that's an interesting question. So as we all know, Electric Boat is slated to hire about 15,000 people over the next X amount of years. And um, that also, though, is accounting for people that are retiring. So it's not 15,000 necessarily brand new people coming to the district. You know, as you have people retire, they're replacing those folks. I have been working closely with the developers in uh, the town of Groton and other towns that are coming up with ideas. They run it by Electric Boat for housing for accommodations, for restaurants, for other things that people that are coming to this area, and many of them are young, would like to see. Um, so that when Electric Boat does make an offer to, you know, let's say it's a young engineer, that they are um, happy to be in, in the area, that they feel fulfilled, they like the housing, there's enough for them to do, and places for them to meet up with other folks of their age. So we've been closely working together. Um, when developers may come to me with ideas, I have a way to be able to bring it to Electric Boat and show it to them and either they're excited or say, oh, I don't think this is going to work. They have been very gracious in telling us um, and I can you know, bring that back to the builders or the developers or the building trades unions. Um, this is what they're looking for if an executive comes here. Um, that's the information we really didn't have before. And I think that's been um, very helpful in trying to create developments that people are going to want to live in and want to want to stay here. I remember when I was first elected, um, I had two young engineers show up at one of my town hall meetings. I'll never forget this. One is still here. And um, one lived in New London and one lived in Groton. And I was just shocked that there was these two young people that were interested in state politics there, first of all. So I went over and chatted with them. And um, they said, what is there to do here? You know, they were both young, under 30. And they, one of them was living in New London saying, you know, there's just not much to do. It's so quiet. Um, the other one was much more outdoorsy, so really, really liked ended up being here but the one that came from Florida didn't end up staying the one that came from um, Texas and had lived a couple other places did stay and those are the folks that we want to obviously assimilate into our community and embrace them and New England in and of itself is not always the most friendly place to come if you're coming from another state and you don't know anyone so we want to make sure that people that do come here um, that are younger that um, have their whole lives ahead of them that maybe we would love to have them stay and have a family and and live their lives here and be part of our community feel welcome that there's enough to do and they have the information to showcase all that Connecticut has to offer because I hear that even from people living on the sub base they, they say they think just route 12 is Groton where once we get them involved um, we've gotten some involved in like our local chambers and they're going to different events around the district you know whether it be in the city of Groton or Mystic they un they see wow there's more to offer than just route 12 so I think we have to do a better job at that and you know my relationship with electric boat is such that we can work together and um, with the towns also to make sure that we um, have the ability to when we are successful in bringing these folks here make sure that they're happy with where they are and it's not just Groton this you know there's many engineers that live outside uh, we have some that live up north a lot live in Norwich a lot of them live in westerly Rhode Island because it's just a fun place to be and you know it has a thriving downtown so I think we could um, learn some lessons from what's happening over in westerly